Hello and welcome to this MindFusion video tutorial where we will build a sample server load application which shows a line chart with data load, a gauge with the average user count, and a diagram of the network. We start by creating an empty website. The first thing we need is a new scripts folder which will hold the libraries. There, we copy the diagramming, charting, common and gauges scripts, jQuery, and the require.js. Another folder named common holds the jQuery UI script. Now let's add a new HTML page, which we name index. There, in the head section, we add references to the required libraries, jQuery and the config.js file used by charts and gauges. We reference another script for the charts file with the data main attribute. Due to peculiarities of the Internet Explorer browser, we add it at the bottom of the page right before the closing body tag. Otherwise, charts and gauges might not load properly in IE. Let's create three Canvas instances, each with an ID. The ID is important because we will access those canvases in the JavaScript code behind. We need a CSS file where we write the layout of the canvases. We start with some general properties for the body and the HTML. Then we create a section tag that uses flexbox layout. The column class for the first column on the second row is interesting. Here we specify that the flexbox layout should give it twice the space it gives other components on the same row, e.g. the gauge. That's the section with the diagram. We link the CSS file from the web page and apply the styling. First, we place the canvas for the chart in a section and another section for the diagram and gauge canvases. Then we add div tags around each canvas. The div tag uses the column class. Now let's start with the real JavaScript coding. We create a new JS file called chart.js in the scripts folder. We must also edit the config.js file because by default the JavaScript file is expected to be in the same directory as the HTML file. We add a new path to scripts slash chart. In the JavaScript file, we declare a global line chart variable. All code used by the chart and gauge must fall into a single define method. There we list the namespaces that are required and then do some mappings for the charting and drawing collections. We create the line chart element using the canvas element that we've initialized in index.html. We identify it by the ID. Then we set some global chart properties like the width and height, the area opacity, and turn off highlighting of chart elements on mouse hover. We use the chart theme object to adjust the legend. No title, light backgrounds, and a thin border stroke. We need a date time JavaScript object because on the X axis we show timestamps. We get the current time and offset it with 30 seconds for the first 30 data values that we add right after the start of the application. 
Let's create 10 lists for the Y data of the 10 series the line chart renders. We need two more lists for the X values and the X labels. Let's add now the sample data to the X values. These are the numbers from 0 to 29. Note that we update only the labels on the X axis and not the data. We use the methods set X labels with a bool argument to generate the data. Let's see how. Set X labels is the method that takes care to add the right timestamps for the X axis. The intervals are 30, but the labels are just 10. Actually, the labels are also 30, but only those who divide accurately on 3 show a timestamp. The other two are empty strings. The bool argument indicates whether to remove the first three labels, e.g. has the total count of labels already reached 30? Let's not forget to add a second to the global date time variable to keep the correct time. The generate data method is a very simple one. It just gets 10 random numbers and adds them to the consecutive data arrays. Let's do some styling for the chart. We add a list for the brushes of each series. The colors are kept in a list that holds other lists with the RGB values for each color. As you know, only the graphics for the currently selected network connections are visualized on the chart. The other just render as fate lines in the background. We achieve this in a simple way. We thicken the strokes for the selected series and we set the thickness of the others to the very small number 0.15. Initially, only the 4th and ninth strokes are bold. We use the per series style class to create the style object for the chart. We provide the lists with brushes and thicknesses as arguments. The per series style takes one brush, one stroke, and one thickness from these arrays and applies them to all elements in a given line series. Time to create the line series. We use the Series2D class and create series instances with X values and Y values. The third argument is for labels, and we set labels just for the first series. Those labels are the timestamps for the X axis, and we will see how they will render there shortly. We assign the series list to the series property of the chart and move to the axes. We set labels and intervals for both axes. We need a second axis to the right and we'll create one. First, we add a new column to the grid that is used as a layout container by the line chart control by default. Then we create a new stack panel with a vertical orientation. We place it in the newly created grid column. We also must add it to the children of the chart panel. We create a Y axis renderer object to render the second Y axis. We don't need to create an axis. We will use the first Y axis and render it again in the new Y axis renderer. How do we make the timestamps appear at the X axis? First, we set them as labels at the axis. We have to hide the coordinates because we don't want to render them both. We also use the supported labels property of the series object to override the default settings which is that labels given to a series 2D object are rendered at its data points. We specify that the labels for the first series are used as labels for the X axis. That's why we set supported labels to label kinds dot X axis label. Let's make some grid customization as well. First, we set a crossed grid. Then we specify the color for the grid brushes and a light gray color for the grid lines. Now we call the draw method to render the chart, but if we want the chart to be updated each second, we must add a timer. The timer set interval invokes the set time method. There we remove the first data of each values list, update the labels, and calculate the average value. This average value will be used by the gauge. Now let's see what we've made so far. We run the application and we see the chart looks as expected. Two of the series are visible. The others can only be noticed moving in the background. The legend shows the series titles, but since we haven't set them, the labels show untitled. Now let's move to the gauge. We map some namespaces that we'll need. Gauges, oval scale, tick shape. Then it's time to create the gauge object. 
As with the chart, we use the ID of the gauge canvas. Then we wire event handlers for two events, pre-paint background and pre-paint pointer. We use the first one to custom paint the background of the gauge. The first thing to do is to cancel the default painting. Then we get the size of the gauge and the drawing context. We paint two ellipses that will make our gauge look more sophisticated. We use the drawing namespace of the gauge's control that greatly facilitates painting. The pre-paint pointer does the same, cancels the default painting, takes the size, the drawing context, and draws an arc. It transforms the context before drawing and then restores the original state. Let's see what we've done. The background is there and looks nice. The pointer is not visible because there's nothing to point yet, but we'll deal with that now. We customize the scale to render the numbers from 0 to 40. We also use the start angle and end angle fields to specify where the scale will be drawn along the gauge oval. We customize the major ticketings, set tick width and length, font size, and the precision of the number for the label. We also change the label stroke to white and adjust the tick alignment and label offset. Here is how the gauge looks. Let's build on that look. We customize the minor tick setting. They don't show labels and ticks. Then we create a new gauge pointer instance. We adjust its color, size, and shape and set its value to 26. You remember that the set time method shall adjust this value each second. We also add a range object to the gauge. The range renders next to the ticks and follows the oval of the gauge. Its color and span can be customized. Our range spans along the entire scale and is colored in gradient colors that give visual indication of degree to which the network is loaded at each moment. Here is what it looks like. We can make the gauge look even better by adding middle tick settings. They also have custom size and fonts, white fill, and are drawn in groups of five between each pair of major intervals. We also add an interval. That's like the range, but drawn on the very scale. The interval we add is for the last section on the gauge, the one that starts from 35. It is painted in red to raise the red flag to the system administrator that the network traffic gets too heavy. Now let's test our application. The chart looks fine, the pointer does not get updated, and we must do that in the set time method. We update the value of the pointer with each method call, and now the gauge works fine. Let's move to the diagram. We first create an empty JavaScript file in the scripts folder and name it diagram.js. We start by mapping some namespaces so we can use them easily. We need diagram, diagram link, style, shape node, and a few more. Before we continue, let's add a reference to diagram.js in the HTML file. We declare a global diagram variable. The diagram does not need a special method to get initialized, so we use the document load function. We get the canvas object thanks to the ID and create a JS diagram instance. Then we set the base and head link shape to arrow and adjust their size. Let's add more link customization. Change the color for the stroke, adjust the font name and font size. Next, we add two diagram listeners that will handle the link selected and diagram clicked events. The first event is used to identify and render the right chart graphics. The second to reset the diagram and the chart to the default state. Now is time to populate the diagram. We do that in a method called onRandomGraph. The method first builds the diagram and then arranges it using the layered layout algorithm. The first thing we do in build diagram is clear all diagram items, if there are any. Then we define a rectangle that identifies the size of our nodes. We create first the web server node that uses a predefined image file located in the icons directory of the project. 
The node must be transparent, so only the image is visible. Finally, we add the node to the diagram items. Then we create the four client nodes. We use the same customizations, just the icon is different. We add four diagram links from the clients to the web server. We add the links to the diagram items collection. We add three more nodes for the network servers and three links to connect them to the web server, the first node we created. The last node that we create is the data server. It is followed by three links, from the data server to the three network servers. Let's not forget to emphasize the two links that correspond to the two series that are initially visible on the line chart. Let's get back to the onRandomGraph method and to the second method that we call there, apply layered layout. As the name suggests, this method applies the layered layout algorithm. This is quite easy to do. We create an instance of the layout, customize the layout direction, the node and layer distance, and call a range. It is important to call resize to fit items at the end. This way, the diagram would automatically adjust to fit all items drawn on it. Now let's write the event handlers for the two events. The first is handled by the onLinkSelected method. There, we take the series style object from the chart and clear all stroke thicknesses. We add a default thickness for each diagram link and chart series. Then we cycle through all selected diagram links and identify the series with the same title as the ID of the link. We set the stroke thickness of those series to a larger number, the thickness of the diagram link as well. Finally, we redraw the chart. Now let's add a reference to the diagram.js file and run the application. When we select a link, all series faint, but no series gets bold. That's because they don't have identifiers yet. We add title to each chart series. Let's refresh the page. Now the titles appear in the legend and when we select a link, the right series gets emphasized. We need to do one more thing. Set the diagram behavior to select only. This means users won't be allowed to create new items on the diagram. Now let's handle the clicked event. The onClicked method just resets the thickness of the diagram links and series strokes to their default values. The fifth and the eighth series are bold, so are the links that correspond to them. One more thing remains to be done. We want to add separator lines to the diagram that will show the client, network, and data types. The lines are unconnected arrows, and here is how we create them. We first take the width and height of the diagram. Then we create a diagram link and we set its head and base shape to null. We do some appearance customization like shadow adjustment, dash stroke, color. We also use the width and height to specify the exact location of the link. The label is aligned to the edge of the diagram link. We use the set control position method to achieve that. The network server's separator is created now, let's the same run way. the application. We just and place test it, it below the first label. The same counts for the data Here server's is the layer. diagram with the layer separators. These links cannot be selected as you see. The application works fine. We select a link from the connected ones and the series that is bound to it gets highlighted. And that's the end of this video tutorial. Thank you for watching and thank you for your interest in MindFusion Developer Tools.